Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago on CTV and Talk City 91.1 FM. We're now going to talk about restorative justice in Trinidad and Tobago. My guest this morning, Ms. Hazel Thompson, Ahi Managing Director, Epiphany Consultancy Services Limited. Good morning and welcome. Good morning and thank How are you. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. And you're no stranger to, to us here. As you were reminding me, we did have a conversation previously about restoration. Same justice. topic, yes. Yes, and we want to continue that discussion mm -hmm. this morning. But mm -hmm. before we get into it, um, you know, reminding our viewers and listeners, what is restorative justice? So when we speak about restorative justice, we are talking about a process to involve to the extent possible. When I say to the extent possible, because it isn't always possible to get all the parties, but all those who have a stake in a specific offence. You bring them together and um, to decide what harm has been caused, how you repair that harm collectively. And you bring them together with their communities of care, we call it. That is their friends or relatives or supporters because no one should stand alone. Mm -hmm. So both the victim or the person who has been wrong and the person who has done the wrongdoing come together and that process happens in a conference called a restorative justice conference. And there is a, a, a program coming up that you'd be having. Yes, to, to it's going this. to be held on the 28th and the 29th of August mm -hmm. at the Hewoding Law School. And you are going to be trained into how to facilitate, to learn how to facilitate a conference. Because it's a structured process. You don't just jump into it. You have to learn how you carry out this process, how you learn to be a facilitator. And the ultimate aim is really to have facilitators all over Trinidad and Tobago. Because you have wrongdoing in all spheres, in all communities. And although restorative justice is mostly identified with criminal wrongdoing, it's been used in schools as well. It's been used for um, disputes or wrongdoing in organizations and wherever people gather, wherever there is a, a conflict that involves wrongdoing, you have a restorative justice conference rather than um, a mediation because mediation is for civil matters. Although I must say that originally it was victim offender mediation that became restorative justice when you added in the communities of care, the people who support the people, because even a wrongdoer needs to have some kind of support. So the victim doesn't stand alone and neither does the wrongdoer. And I like to explain restorative justice by a story. This is a story, a true story about a woman, a South African woman, Dr. Ramashala. She was in, actually in Rwanda attending a reconciliation, and like South Africa had a mm -hmm. Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So there she was in Rwanda. And she got a telephone call that told her that her house had been burned to the ground. They were able to arrest her. This is a black woman, and she's living in a middle-class community, and maybe people felt that a black woman shouldn't be in that upscale community. So a number of youths went into her house, they messed it up, and they burnt it to the ground. Mm -hmm. And they, they found at least 12 of them. It was about 60 of them were involved. But it, it really went crazy. And she said, you've identified 12 youths. I'm not going to prosecute them. They are going to rebuild my house. Her brothers, the police, everyone was angry with her. She said, no. They are going to raise the funds, rebuild my house. They are going to continue in school. Every six months, they're going to send me a report on how they're doing in school. So they have to stay in school. And also, they have to find members of the community, especially old women and men, who need assistance, and they are going to help them. And that whole community get to, got together and assisted with helping the old people and raising money, and she got a house rebuilt. So that was restorative justice in action. And um, there's also the story of Veronica. Here you have this young girl working in a supermarket, and lo and behold, they found that she had stolen $4,000. The employee was very upset because he said, you know, this child has been working with me since she was a student, and she was such a good worker that when she left high school, I took her on and kept her working there. I didn't expect that she, who I believe so much in, should um, steal from me. But when they brought her together in a conference with her family and so on, and she began to talk about what happened. Because you don't ever ask, 
why you did it, you ask what happened. She talked about her family and the responsibility. She was the only one working, and the employer said, you know something? Every payday, I used to see this girl family outside there waiting for her money. And there was so much responsibility on her that she felt she just couldn't cope. A funeral in the family, she has to pay for it. Anything that happened, she has to pay for it. And the family was pressuring her. So they came together and they found her another place of employment and agreed that instead of going through the criminal justice process to the end, that although she was before the court, if she repaid that money, they would drop the charges. And that's the thing about restorative justice. It can be at any stage of the justice process. It can be before you charge, because the police are the gatekeepers who decide who they're going to charge, you know. Mm -hmm. When you go to YPC, you see one type of person. And don't for one moment believe that the people who live in the upper, ech with the upper echelons of society don't commit crimes. I can tell you for a fact, they do. But they aren't always readily arrested. So here you have a system that can um, actually be used before the person is charged. When they're charged, they're going through the criminal justice system. And even after they have been sentenced, you can still have restorative justice to decide what kind of sentence. So the magistrate or the judge can stop the process, send them into a conference, and um, at the end of the day, that may or may not inform the justice person who's presiding as to what kind of sentence. But how, how difficult is it, or is it difficult, to get people to come together, if you say the community, mm -hmm. to help this person? You know, if you, um, you read the story written, and I must thank, not the story, a letter by Dr. Margaret Nakid Chatur. She wrote a letter in the Sunday newspaper and it's entitled, Is Justice Really Blind? And she spoke about two cases that are going through the court, eh? that went through the court recently. One with the mother who was found in marijuana, and um, she was sentenced to 12 months, and the father fined for allegedly attempting to treat his children's asthma. And in the first story, I recall when I read the newspaper, is that when she was sent off to prison, this mother, all her family crying. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, why didn't they, instead of crying now that she's going off to prison, come together and ask what are her needs? How can we help her? And that's what the conference does. It's the needs of the victim and the needs also of the perpetrator, the wrongdoer. What are his needs? What are the obligations? But I must say, before we have um, a conference, there must be an admission of wrongdoing. So if it is that the person has not accepted that they've done anything wrong, then you can't have the conference, yes? So that what we're doing um, on the 20th and 29th is to train people to facilitate this conference. We don't have legislation here. Jamaica has passed legislation where the court has said, you know, you, at any stage, various stages, you, have, you can have a conference. Jamaica has opened 16 centers for restorative conferences. Since about 2014, the Minister of Justice mandated the Minister of Education to work together to bring restorative justice to every community. In the OECS, there's legislation as well. Trinidad has been talking a lot about restorative justice, and although there are restorative justice practices in what they do with the boys on bail and the girls on bail as well, what they do in terms of victim, you know, so there are pockets of processes but when we talk restorative justice, according to the International Institute of Restorative Practices, where I did my training, and in fact, that's in Pennsylvania, and you know, from whom I have the license to do the training, we're talking about bringing together everybody. We're talking, if there is no, all the parties are not represented, we do not call it restorative justice. You know, so that you have a lot of processes where, in fact, you do have segments of the restorative justice. You have circles, you know. So we're using it for so many things, even in sexual harassment cases. They're using it in university. There's a, a report, Campus Prison, which speaks about sexual offenses on campus and how they're using that. Because many times, the offender doesn't really understand the impact, you know, on the victim. I had um, twice to conduct sexual harassment um, investigations. And it's always a case of the offender not harassing one woman, mm -hmm. 
but a series of women and not recognizing that there's anything wrong. So that when they hear exactly how the person feels, it does something to you. It's not a soft option, you know. Many people think, oh, you're going to say that um, you want to go to a conference and therefore you won't go to jail. But when you sit in the conference and your mother is there or your siblings and they're actually hearing what you've done, you know, that, that shame, you, you can only feel shame generally, people you care about, eh? because you really don't care about the other people. But sometimes the little brother, the little sister, the mother, the father, when you have to face them and say, this is what you've done. Yeah, but when everybody feels the same remorse after committing the crime, and what about those people who are repeat offenders? All right. Now, everybody, it is true. Because sometimes they are so damaged, you know, inside. They've gone through so much that it takes a while. So this process isn't for everybody. But it is a process that should be available for those who want to go that route. Because as I said before, if there's no admission of wrongdoing, then you can't proceed with the conference. So, so is it something similar to like Alcoholics Anonymous or one of those things where you have to admit there is some, some problem and then you go and you sit and you interact with people who may have had the similar problem or, uh, and you know, talk about it and, and get information and try to help each other? Is it something similar to that? Well, there is an element of helping because a lot of it is the community part of it is accountability. And um, I'm not sure like the analogy to, but they do say there's an admission. So in that case, you know, you, I am, um, like I say, you know, I'm a recovering um, as a teacher, I used to beat, so I, I say yes, I'm Hazel Thompson, I, and I'm a recovering um, proponent of non-violent um, correction of children. Mm -hmm. So you see, um, so, so that's one aspect of it. But you know, um, it's a healing kind of justice that we're talking about. And when you come to the law school and you do the training, you will understand a lot better about what can happen. So call me, 2238159, 2238159. Oh, and and um, to get more information. I'll get, you know, you'll get uh, more information about it. Before we give more information as it relates to mm -hmm. the program that you're having, um, the crimes that you mentioned are not what people would consider the most heinous crimes. So if you look at it with murder compared mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. stealing $4,000 from, mm -hmm. from your, your place of work, you know, it may be easy for families to come together to discuss the $4,000 mm -hmm. issue rather than having to come together and look somebody who killed your, a relative of yours in the face and try to work that out. Well, it has happened. And one of the cases that I like to talk about is one that occurred in um, one of the conferences in an Atlanta prison. Here was this guy who had murdered this woman's only daughter on the child's birthday. She was 18 years of age. And there she was with her friend and a boyfriend in the apartment, and they were having fun. And this man walked in, and he killed two of them. And the mother said, you know, I knew it was my daughter's birthday. I was trying to call, and the phone was only ringing, and then somebody came on the phone. And she realized what was happening. I mean, she was totally devastated. She said for years. For years, she couldn't come to a place that she could think that she could, you know, forgive or anything like that. And he went through all the processes of appeal and so on. And he was on his way to get his lethal injection. And she agreed to meet with him in the prison. And that's where he shared the story with her. He said, you know, I was on my way home. I'd been to court that day. The judge had taken my children away from me. I felt I had lost everything. And I saw these people looking very happy. And something snapped in me. And he went into that house and he stabbed up that girl and he, you know, he damaged the boyfriend and you know, he was just on a rampage. And he said, he's had all these years to think. He said, if I could return your child to you with my life, I would do it. So she left eventually feeling a sense of peace. She said, you know, I, am a, I grew up as a good Catholic and I know about forgiveness. And I felt the hatred in my soul for so many years. And at last, I feel a sense of peace. I was able to look at him and see the sorrow that he felt, the genuine sorrow. Because he had nothing to gain again, you know. He was still executed. But he felt at the end 
I have an opportunity to say, I am sorry. And this is my opportunity. I'm, I am genuinely sorry. You know, I always think about this woman who lost her twin daughters in an accident. And I say to myself, if we could get together with the, the young man who was driving and can talk to her and him and bring them together and he has an opportunity to say, I am sorry, how powerful would that be? But you know, it's a tape that I show from New Zealand. And this man knocked down this three-year-old child and killed her. And for years, the mother was bitter. And they arranged a conference. And he came to the conference. And he said, you know, I was backing out my car. I could not have seen that little child. And I am so sorry. He said, I want to come to you to say I'm sorry. I want to come to the funeral. But my lawyer told me, stay away. Don't come to you. And I'm so glad I get the opportunity to come to tell you I'm so sorry. And in that conference, even the little children, mm -hmm. four and five years old, wrote little notes and say, I miss my cousin so much. You know, I love my cousin, and my cousin is no longer with me. So everybody at the end, and he gave a big tapestry to the family. He said he still has to go to court. He doesn't know what the judge will do to him. But he's glad for the opportunity to say, I am sorry that I have caused this harm. Unwittingly, you know, I'm not... He, not that he did anything wrong, but the accident was caused by his hand, by his vehicle, and he's sorry about the pain that he caused. And that mother smiled for the first time in the longest while, and she said, you know, all the hate that she's feeling, you know. And there's so many stories, because restorative justice is all over the world now, all over the world. And I would really like to see it in every village, every community center, that you have people trained. You have the community police, and they should be trained. The prison, and Jamaica has put out this policy before the legislation and said how many different areas, these poor people working in sports, people working in religion, and all of these people, they need healing. All the time there's wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And if we can bring people together to have this healing kind of justice, you know, and it's proven to stop recidivism to a large extent. People don't go back into the, the into reoffending because, um, you know, they have achieved some healing. Now, this morning, I'm going to attend the regional work planning meeting for child protection focal points. So you have people coming in from various countries, Angola, Antigua, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, Montreal, St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. And one of the topics that's going to be discussed, in fact, the keynote address is going to be restorative justice practices for juvenile sex offenders. Mm -hmm. And I really want to hear what they're going to be talking about this morning. Because right now on the table is an amendment to our Sexual Offenses Act mm -hmm. in Trinidad and Tobago. So it, it probably is a lot to look forward to. So mm -hmm. for, for the conference that you would be having, for the meetings yeah, that the you training, would be having, yes. can you give us some information? All right. So it's at the Hewood in Law School in St. Augustine. And it's, between, it's half past eight to half past four. And it's on the 28th and 29th Tuesday, so two Tuesdays from now, two mm -hmm. weeks from now exactly, at the law school. And the cost is $3,500. The early bird has long passed, and it's including the textbooks, writing materials, lunch, refreshments. You know, it's, it's, and at the end, you get a certificate. And this certificate comes from the International Institute of Restorative Practices. And some people would have done the proactive part already, where we do the circles and so on, restore. And some people now they're going to be doing, some of them will be doing the, which is a standalone project, also facilitating restorative conferences. And some of the students who've done it before, they've actually gone ahead, because you get credit, and they get, they've done the, one just graduated last year and did her, got her master's degree. So she did the training with me, you know, sometime a, a couple of years ago. So it's part, you can start your training here and then go on to do your diploma, um, your graduate diploma, and then you can do your degree, your master's degree. But first of all, you must have a degree from a recognized university. And, and to get more information, members of the public can call 223-8159. Or, or email me, as some people have been doing, at Epiphany Consultancy, Epiphany Consultancy, TNT, at gmail.com. So you get your, um, and we'll tell you how to pay in the bank and so on. 
and you come, it's much cheaper. We have people coming in from St. Lucia for the project. Last year, we had people coming in from six Caribbean countries because it's much cheaper to do it in Trinidad yeah. here than to go to Pennsylvania. It will cost you five times the cost yeah. to go and do it. Ms. Well. Hazel Thompson, Ahi Managing Director, Epiphany Consultancy Services Limited. Thank you very much for coming on. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago, and chatting with us mm -hmm. about restorative justice. This is, is Good Morning, pleasure. Trinidad and Tobago. We take a break and come back with more.